As we travel more on this planet, epidemics will be more acute. We will have a germ population dominated by a few numbers, and the successful killer will spread vastly more effectively. I see the risks of a very strange, acute virus spreading throughout the planet. That was you, Nassim Taleb, writing in 2007. If an epidemic was predictable, Nassim, was yes. a pandemic preventable? No, well, that, that's the whole point. Of course it was uh, preventable. And we've known from, uh, you know, uh, Jan 26, when we issued our warning, that, uh, that effectively uh, you should kill it in the egg if you can and, and act very quickly. And, of course, people ignored it, except perhaps just a tiny bit the Trump administration by closing uh, travel uh, from China or restricting it in some ways. So it was not a black swan. It was a white swan. And I'm so irritated at people who say it's a black swan. We have had black swans. September 11 was definitely a black swan. This was the, the white swan. And it's no excuse for companies, corporations, not to be prepared for that. And definitely no excuse for governments to not be prepared for something like this. Hey, everybody. Free Accident Podcast. Todd Conklin. How are you today? Good. Am I catching you at a good time, or is this a bad time? You want me to call back? I can call back if I need to. So it's the podcast. It's time. Today's interesting. There's, I have lots of podcasts um, lined up and ready and in the circle, and people who want to be on. I've got, I've got, oh, my goodness, it's very exciting. My life is nothing but a thrill. But today's going to be a little different because today I wanted to talk to you because I stumbled across – an article, actually an article I think you'd be really interested in. And I picked it up on something called medium.com, which I know nothing about, but I was kind of Google searching around like I do. Uh, probably what I was really doing, if I must admit it, is probably looking for some stupid YouTube video that would tell me. So I, I've jumped into the electric bicycle, um, arena, uh, I haven't jumped in yet because don't ever order a electric bicycle during a pandemic. So I can't really get one. I mean, it's, it's but, uh, but I've, I've jumped into this arena. So I've ordered an electric bicycle. I, well, we can talk about this all you want to, um, because I feel like I need to do something other than eat. I, although I'm a big fan of eating, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to stop that, but this was an interesting way to get around. And my sister and her husband rented them, gosh, six months ago, and came back and said, oh, oh yeah, that's uh, that's pretty darn fun. And so I've always ridden a, a little scooter, a little Vespa scooter. So that's, uh, and that's a whole story, too. We could talk about that. The reason I got a Vespa scooter is because I was becoming really risk adverse, and it's a long story. I mean, it's a lot of psychology. We can go into it, but you'll need a couch. But this bicycle seems like a really interesting idea and they're fun and they're really trendy. In fact, one third of the bicycles sold in Europe are electric. So it's been around a while. So I'm probably cruising around looking for the electric bicycle stuff. That's what I was doing. And I bump in, can I say that is bumping in the right thing to say? Yeah. I bump into a little paper, uh, by Nassim Taleb. And do you remember him? So he wrote the book that he wrote that kind of put him on the map in our world was in 2007 or so. I'd have to check that, but that feels about right to me. He wrote a book called The Black Swan, which really had dramatic impact in the academy. A lot of people read it. A lot of practitioners read it. And, and it really it must have scratched some itch for him because you heard a lot about this idea and, and when Nassim Taleb talks about black swan events, he, he defines it pretty nicely. He's basically talking about low probability, high consequence events, right? And if you're in Australia, black swan events don't really resonate the same level because you have black swans. But his idea was black swans are pretty rare. Then he wrote, he followed that with Anti-Fragile, which I found that book to be remarkably interesting as it discusses resilience, it kind of takes 
a philosophical approach to some of David Woods' work, and it talks about the ability for a system to break, to recover, and be stronger at the point where it breaks. And his example would be bones are anti-fragile. And it's interesting because the anti-fragile idea seemed really crazy talk at first, but it's the opposite of of healing. It's 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 becoming really resistant to fragility. Then he wrote Skin in the Game, which was interesting. And he has, I think he has a whole bunch more, like Fooled by Randomness was a big book. That came out pretty early. But the, those are the games that are the, the books. I guess maybe they're board games. Uh, you'll have to talk to Milton Bradley on that. Those are the books that he wrote. And I I just, uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed him, immensely enjoyed him. He's He's definitely got strong opinions. There's no question about that. But I, I actually find that kind of attractive. And he's he, he writes a lot, right? And he came out and wrote an essay on mask wearing. And the reason this matters is, so today's the 20th of, of June, 2020. And today's a really interesting day in the United States because there is a big political rally this evening where thousands and thousands and thousands of people are going to amass in inside in an auditorium in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We talk about this a lot. There's just a lot going on here. But the bottom line is, from a infectious disease standpoint, during a pandemic, this is the first time that a large group like this has a mask. And so this is a big part of thinking. If you're thinking about safety and health, and stability and reliability and resilience, this is a big deal. This is the first time we will have a giant mass event. And it's inside. I mean, it's, it's, it's the perfect combination of things that we probably should not be doing, that they certainly have told us not to do. And they're not going to require masks to be worn because the mask issue has become really interestingly political. And and when PPE becomes political, we should probably think about this. I mean, I, again, I, I have strong opinions on this. You probably have strong opinions on this. Bottom line is, doesn't really matter what our opinions are. This is what's happening. And so he wrote this this great little paper, and you can pick it up and see it. But but I thought I would kind of run through it with you a little bit this Saturday, just because it seems timely. It seems like something we ought to talk about. And the paper is titled Incompetence and Errors in Reasoning Around Face Covering. And he's got six errors that he identifies and then talks about them a little bit. And so I I thought I would at least give you an overview of what Nassim says and then allow you the ability to kind of hang out and think about them. And, And maybe if you want to, you can pick up the article. It's it's certainly worth our time to introduce these ideas because it's thoughtful and applies really across the board to what we do. And the six errors are not surprising, but I think they're interesting, and I think you'll learn something. Error number one, and he just lists them in the, at the first of the paper. Error number one is we're missing the compounding effect of masks, and we should talk about that because that – that is very true, and that's something we should think about really across the board with PPE, right? Number two, we're missing the nonlinearity of the probability of infection to viral exposures when we use masks. So now we're already talking about nonlinear systems. That's going to be interesting as well. Number three, we're missing the absence of evidence or evidence of absence. And we should talk about that because I came from a big science background. I've heard that phrase before, and I, I do think that's really interesting. Uh, it's kind of like the reverse of correlation does not prove causality. We'll, we'll talk more about it. He, he discusses it. Number four, 
we're missing the point that people do not need governments to produce facial coverings. They can make their own. A bandana is a good alternative. Actually, it's not only a good alternative, it kind of makes you look like a cowboy. Just saying. That's all I'm saying. Number five, we're missing the compounding effects of statistical signals. You knew that was coming because that's kind of Nassim's entire life, and that's a pretty important part of what we want to talk about. And then number six, we're ignoring the non-aggression principle that's made by, and this is a word he uses, pseudo-libertarians. And he goes on to talk about this one by saying, masks are also to protect others from you. And it's a multiplying process. Every person you infect will, in fact, infect others. Basic kind of stand down of epidemiology. Certainly the premise of what's going on and why we're having this conversation. So this is really interesting. And he goes on to talk about them one by one. And this first one, he talks about missing the compounding effect of masks. He says that people who are good at taking exams, so he's looking at kind of academics, he's looking at probably engineers, he's looking at intellectuals. He says, in his experience, are not good at understanding nonlinearities and dynamics. And he goes on to comment that the WHO and the CDC, these kind of organizations, initially failed to quickly realize that the benefit of masks compound. Simply because two people are wearing them, you have to look at the interaction that the two people have. So to simplify this, he goes on to say, let's say that masks reduce both the transmission and the reception to a virus. So he goes on to say, so what effect does that have on the rate of spreading the infection. And the naive approach, the initial approach that was taken, is to say that masks reduce the transmission probability to about one quarter, right? So he goes on to say that that's that's about a quarter reduction in transmission. He says it's it's big, that's huge, but that's the wrong way to think about it. Because you have to count the mask on both sides. I wear one, you wear one. And so he says if they reduce transmission by one quarter, the drop in infection, the drop in transmission, actually will become 93.75%. Because you divide the drop in infection by 16. So even with masks that work at 50%, we'd get a 75% drop in reduction. So it's really the compounding effect added to the fact that they're high, it's highly infectious. He goes on then to talk about the second error, the, the missing the nonlinearity of the risk of infection. So he's going to talk about complex systems, and that's exactly what he talks about. He said the, the error is to think that if I reduce the exposure to the virus by, say, one half, I would then reduce the risk expressed as probability, which is how people look at risk, by one half as well. He says that's not true. And we know this to be true because he says if you look at, if you, if you look at the statistical distribution, you're going to have a chart that has response on the x-axis and dose on the y-axis. You're, you're, you're going to look at sort of if you're exposed and did you get it. And we know this because this is how it happens, that the actual line that follows on that chart will not move linearly. I never can say that word, so don't criticize me. It'll actually move in a complex system. It'll make an arc, like an S-curve, right? A diffusion curve. We've seen it a million times. In fact, if you look at sort of safety over time, accidents over time, they don't go linearly down. I really can't say that word. They they go down in, in a series of S curves. And and the, we, we've talked about this a bunch of times. Now, here's where this gets interesting, is that probability must, and in fact always follows 
a nonlinear curve, an S-curve. And in the curvy part of the S-curve, the convex part of the S-curve, the gains are always disproportionately larger. And so we always gain more protection as our protection diffuses because it has a very um, early S curve to it. So it has a, a rather aggressive nonlinear curve to it that actually makes improvement more. This is true, you guys, of everything. So it's not just true of, of wearing masks, but it's true of, of all of our statistical distributions. And we're learning tons about statistical distributions just by watching the news, right? So if you, just as an example, because of the convex part of the curve, if you reduce the viral load by 75%, a short exposure really probably reduces the viral load by a probability of about 95%. And then it'll level off. And then it'll sort of respond as if the line was there. The third error he talks about is this clever science thing they say all the time, mistaking the absence of evidence for the evidence of absence. So he, 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 he describes this by making a quote, there's no evidence that masks work. And you do hear that. Uh, and, and because of the way the mask was socialized and diffused early, they kind of said that to us. The point is, is that that's not evidence-based. The absence of evidence is not evident. So, and, and I should say this again, because there's a kind of a big war going on around science. And because there is no evidence does not mean there is not evidence. And the point would be is that if you lock the door to your house tonight, it, it, there's no evidence to prove that it will prevent you from being burglarized. Right? It helps, but it doesn't prove you won't be burglarized. So we have to think about this. And he goes on to say the point is, is that there's no evidence that locking the door tonight will prevent me from being burglarized but everything that may block transmission could help. And he goes on to say, and this is kind of his classic spanking, unlike school, real life is not about certainty. So we know that. When in doubt, use protection when you can. Some people are invoking the flawed rationalization that masks induce false confidence. In fact, there's really a strong argument that masks make one more alert to the risk and more conservative in their behavior. Think about it. I mean, this, this, this is right in our, he is in our wheelhouse now, right? So we're there. His fourth error is that misunderstanding the market and the people. So the, the sort of the fatherly approach, he, he calls them paternalistic bureaucrats but this is the government as the protector approach, resisted inviting the general public to use masks on the grounds that the supply was initially limited and would be needed by health professionals. So he goes on to say, so they lied to us and said that masks are not effective. They did not get to the inventiveness and the industriousness of people who do not need a government to tell them what to do or produce masks for them. They can rapidly convert just about anything into a well-functioning protective face covering. Bandanas, coffee filters. I mean, you, you heard all these stories. In fact, we talked about them as adaptions. People adapted to find ways to solve this problem. They didn't need bureaucrats to do it for them. Nor did they need bureaucrats, he goes on to say, to heed the notion of the market and the existence of opportunities that can supply people with what they want. Left to their own devices, people can be adaptive. And if they understand the benefit of the protection, the adaption will soon follow and be incredibly creative and not need, his words, the paternalistic effort. The fifth area he talks about in this paper is the missing of extremely strong statistical signals. 
So he goes on to say that many people who deal with stats think in terms of either mechanistic concepts, that's correlational data, we talk about this all the time, or they think of local results. And he would call those anecdotal data. This is kind of the classic struggle that we have between quantitative and qualitative. I mean, there's there's sort of a classic struggle here. He, he's not really making that point, but he's going on to say correlative data, data versus anecdotive data. And all of that really creates a little smokescreen that fails to illuminate the broader notion of statistical signals. You look at the whole story, not the the minuscule parts of the story. And when you look holistically at mask wearing, the evidence starts to compound upon each other. And the example he uses, which is the same one I've thought about a bunch, is the beauty shop in Missouri where two infected stylists who worked for four days with 140 clients failed to infect their clients. Now, the reason they didn't infect their clients is because both the stylists and the clients were wearing masks, making the probability of infection for bilateral mask wearing safety well below 1% for beauty shop style exposure. We know the probability for infection for non-mask wearers from tens of thousands of data points and the rate of infection of countries where masks were worn, we also have tens and thousands of data points there. And that holistic, more systemic understanding is really where the game is won. And then it's six there. And this one's got a little edge on it. And he calls it the non-aggression principle. And he goes on to say, People who are resisting mass wearing on the grounds that it constrains their freedom have a skewed sense of the concept of liberty and that liberty lies not in aggressively forcing it, but the non-aggression principles around something he calls the silver rule, which is do not harm others and they in turn should not harm you. Even more insulting is the demand by these these people that organizations, companies, even stores should be banned from forcing their customers to wear masks. So he goes on to say that libertarianism allows you to set the rules for your own freedom on your own property, but other stores, other organizations, they also share that same right to create the rules for their own stores, their own facilities, and their own properties. And he goes on to say that, that note that by infecting another person, you're not infecting just another person you are infecting many, many, many more people and causing systemic risk. And then his last words are, wear a mask for the sake of others. That's a really quick overview. Hopefully, if I did my job well, you'll now want to go and read it yourself. And you should, because don't take my word for it. That's just my interpretation I've read a lot of his stuff, so I'm relatively comfortable. And there's an edge to him. He's an essayist. But he's an essayist that talks a lot about risk and probability and uncertainty and resilience. I think it's kind of worth our time to listen to what Nassim has to say. That, my friends, is our discussion for today. Stay with me because there's some really interesting pods in the shoot. In fact, everybody just got moved back one for today's discussion. You're going to like them. I appreciate the time. Thanks for listening. Tell your friends. 
subscribe. Think about this. This is kind of a homework podcast for you. Learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, be safe.